So my name is Ron Adler. I'm a professor of radiology at New York uh, University uh, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I work at a place called the Center for Musculoskeletal Care, which is part of the NYU uh, Medical Center. It's a dedicated outpatient orthopedic uh, hospital um, and, uh, or outpatient center. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is ultrasound-guided interventions in the uh, musculoskeletal system. We're going to start out with some background information and a few technical considerations, talk about some basics, what uh, musculoskeletal anatomy looks like on ultrasound, and then give, and basically by way of a series of clinical examples, show you the types of uh, injections that we do. Well, of course, uh, the utility of ultrasound is that it allows excellent depiction of the soft tissues, tendons, muscles, and so forth. It's tomographic, which means we have uh, stereotactic placement of the needle in real time. And of course, the real-time aspect of ultrasound, perhaps one of the most important things, because it allows us to do continuous monitoring uh, during needle placement, as well as follows the distribution of the injected material or aspirated material. There is a contrast effect that we're going to talk about in a few minutes that also can be beneficial when we do ultrasound-guided interventions. And also importantly, uh, because ultrasound is not subject to things like susceptibility artifact or streak artifact that we would have in MRI or, or computer tomography, it doesn't at all interfere with our ability to see soft tissues overlying orthopedic instrumentation. And because of that, uh, we can do a variety of procedures in patients who have, uh, who've had previous orthopedic procedures. The important things is that you have a good sense of the equipment that you're using, you know the scanning techniques for musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound imaging, how to optimize your imaging, and what, op what, optimal, uh, what transducer you optimally choose for any given procedure. Knowledge of the sonographic anatomy is also very important when you're doing these types of procedures. So let's talk about some basics to begin with. Uh, just to remind you that uh, on ultrasound, tendons appear echogenic and fibrillar as opposed to uh, the, the low signal intensity appearance that we're used to seeing when we're looking at a magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and because of this uh, fibrillar architecture that we see in tendons, tendons display a property known as anisotropy. And what I mean by that is when the beam incidates perpendicular to the long axis of the tendon, the tendon will appear to be fairly bright or echogenic. Whereas if it, uh, if it incidates at some angle, and it could be as little as five degrees, the tendon becomes progressively hypocog. Now, this is important in interventions because if we're doing tendon sheath injections, we, we don't want to falsely interpret uh, hypocoke tendon as being fluid uh, since we don't want to, we want to avoid doing an intratendinous injection. So anisotropy is something we always need to be aware of when we're doing these types of procedures. Muscle, alternatively to tendons, tends to be hypocoke. Uh, we see uh, uh, back, uh, sort of a hypocog background with the interspersed with these fine linear echogenic structures corresponding to the fiber adipose connective tissue as opposed to the intermediate signal intensity uh, structure that we see when we're looking at the magnetic resonance imaging. Um, Bones, bones and joints, so let's, bones are, are strong specular reflectors that have posterior acoustic shadowing. The junction of uh, smoothly articulating surfaces we see uh, as in, uh, depicted in this MCP joint or in this hip joint below. Uh, we may see a thin hypocoic layer overlying the cortical surface corresponding to uh, articular cartilage. We may see presence of intraarticular fat uh, or uh, capsule, which generally appears echogenic uh, on ultrasound. So this is in the case of an MCP joint. This is in the case of a hip joint, where we have overlying echogenic capsule, uh, a little bit of fibro uh, uh, cartilage over here, which tends to appear echogenic, and a thin hypocoic layer overlying the articular surface of the, of the femoral head. Nerves appears uh, uh, when we look at them in cross section. Look, uh, I sort of liken them to a cluster of grapes. They, we see the hypocoque fossicles separated by internal epinorium, which is the uh, connective tissue, uh, loose connective tissue that surrounds the nerve fascicles, and they're surrounded by a echogenic layer called the outer epinorium. Uh, that gives rise to that sort of echogenic layer. And if we turn our transducer 90 degrees, so we're looking at the nerve in long axis, we see these hypocoque fascicles sort of elongated, and, and some people have likened this to a tram track appearance. Now, the principle of doing uh, ultrasound-guided interventions, at least in, uh, in my experience, we, we prefer to use a freehand technique where the object is to make the uh, needle appear as a, as a strong specular reflectors. 
Uh, one of the advantages that we have is oftentimes metal has a characteristic strong reverberation artifact as we see in this needle over here. Uh, we want to optimally choose our needle position. Uh, so I usually put a, a small offset in the skin relative to where the transducer is positioned so we can see the needle as much as possible as a specular uh, reflector as it is indicated here. Just as in any other type of interventional procedure, we're going to use sterile technique. Uh, so we're going to have our tray set up ideally uh, with uh, sterile gel, sterile drapes, and so on, so that we can do the procedure sterily. OK, so by manner of, uh, um, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce a, a little bit of nomenclature to, before we go on. Uh, you're going to hear me use the term long axis and short axis, and I want to define what I mean by that. So by long axis, I mean uh, where the needle's going parallel to the long axis of either a joint or a tendon. So the typical example of that, for instance, will be the hip, where I'm scanning longitudinally across the joint, and my needle's going in the plane of the uh, transducer, so it's going in what I would consider the long axis of, of the joint, as indicated in this uh, injection below. And typical examples of that would be hip injections and shoulder injections, as we'll see in a few minutes. But what I mean by short axis, on the alternatively, is perpendicular to the long axis of the structure. And the, the, op, the typical example of that is doing a retrocalcaneal bursal injection. So in this uh, example over here, you can see the um, this is the Achilles tendon in long axis. So what I'm doing is I'm scanning in short axis across the tendon, and I'm visualizing the needle as it comes in perpendicular to the tendon. So since it's coming in perpendicular to the tendon, I refer to that as a short axis technique. And this is what this would look like on ultrasound. You see the tendon in cross section above, and you see uh, the needle coming in uh, in long axis, just the way we're visualizing here in this uh, corresponding uh, image. And again, most importantly, we're always observing things in real time. And so here's a long axis approach to a hip injection. And uh, you're going to see, uh, we're going to see distension of the joint capsule. And we see the presence of micro bubbles going to the non-dependent surface. So there's some internal contrast that we have just by virtue of what we inject, because invariably there's a small amount of uh, air bubbles uh, in the contained mixture. Now, contrast can be from uh, injecting micro bubbles, but can, it can also be from the injectate itself. So this is an example of, uh, of injection of a, uh, a tendon sheath in the dorsal aspect of the ankle. And you'll see that there are echoes generated just by virtue of the therapeutic mixture. And this has to do with the fact that uh, many of us use uh, this particular suspension, such as uh, trimcinolone or depamedrol, uh, which when placed in an aqueous me medium auto automatically produces a, 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 an inherent contrast effect. And we've estimated this to be as much as uh, 20 dB in increased contrast. So what I mean by that is uh, we'll see in the next example. This was actually uh, some work that we did a few years ago where we just simply looked at a cis phantom. And here you can see uh, an anechoic cis. And this is the background uh, over here. And what happened is when we, when we injected a, uh, this uh, mixture of steroid and in, uh, in, uh, in anesthetic solution, so it became sort of a suspension. As soon as you inject, you get this significant contrast effect. And uh, as you would expect, since it's particulate uh, uh, substrate that we're injecting, um, it will settle out over time. And so you expect to see a gravitational effect. So with time, you actually see a settling effect that occurs just simply by virtue of gravity. And we, in fact, looked at this a little bit more quantitatively. So if this top line represents the background, uh, and this uh, upper line represents the lower half of the cyst, and this uh, upper part, uh, this lower part here represents the upper part of the cyst, you notice that the, that the contrast settles more rapidly in the upper part of the cyst, where it's uh, taking a little bit more time in the, in the bottom 50% of the cyst, as you would expect, since we're not only losing contrast uh, material, but we're also gaining it from the upper half. And then eventually, it falls off fairly dramatically uh, once we've lost the, the contribution from the upper half of the cis phantom. So it's exactly what you would expect if we, if we were uh, seeing a gravitational effect due to uh, settling of a contrast. Now, there's a wide variety of um, uh, types of injections and aspirations that we do uh, in this table on the list. Uh, this is, by all means, not, not all-inclusive, but gives you a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that we do fairly uh, typically in our practice.
Now let's start by talking about joints uh, and we'll start with small to medium joints and uh, these are basically the small joints of the ankle and foot, hand, wrist and elbow. Uh, much of the time what we're going to be injecting is a smaller amount of steroid. I typically use something on the order of uh, 10 to 20 uh, milligrams of triamcinolone or methylprednisolone. Uh, sometimes with the upper extremity in particular where chiasmesis becomes important, we'll use something that's more rapidly absorbed such as celestone. Uh, because those types of steroids are less apt to produce depigmentation or skin atrophy. We generally will use a short axis approach, a 25 gauge needle is uh, satisfactory for all, virtually all these injections, and we use a high frequency linear transducer. So this would be the, the example of injecting a, how we would place our transducer if we were looking at the first MTP joint. So that's what we'll do is our typical example of a short axis approach. So here's this, here in this uh, image in the right uh, lower corner, we see how the transducer would be positioned if we were doing a, a first MTP joint in injection. This will be a short axis approach. So here we have the first uh, metatarsal, the proximal phalanx. There's actually a small joint body situated in the dorsal recess of the joint. And uh, then when I'm placing my needle in short axis, because uh, of, of how I'm scanning along the long axis of the joint, you can only see the needle in cross sections. So you see a little echogenic focus with a strong reverberation artifact. So we know that's the needle placement and not simply a joint body. And uh, then what we do is we perform our injection and you can see the stension of the dorsal recess is indicated over here and possibly some low level echoes due to the contrast material, uh, that contrast effect that we spoke about a few minutes ago. This is what this would look in real time. So we have our needle and cross section and you can see the contrast effect from the injected steroid anesthetic mixture coming in. We have, see the extension of the dorsal capsule. So looking in real time, you have a nice, uh, you know for sure that you're getting intraarticular as well as you're nicely distending the joint. We could so apply the same uh, principle to other small joints. This is a base of thumb injection. This is the uh, uh, the first uh, carpal metacarpal joint, this is the trapezium articulating with the first metacarpal. Uh, this is what this would look like in a radiograph that you see in this image in the right lower corner. And so the, let's see what uh, this injection will look like. So here's our baseline image over here. Here's the trapezium. Here's the base of the first metacarpal. And uh, this is uh, placing my needle in short axis. So you can see a little bit of reverberation artifact from where the needle is in position below the joint capsule, which is situated over here. And then what we're going to do is do our injection. So we're going to see the stension of the dorsal capsule, uh, as we see over here, filled with uh, fluid. And you see that contrast effect that we spoke about earlier. So that now we have a successful injection of the base of the thumb. Typical injections that we do for long axis are the hip and the shoulder. Uh, uh, we do, for, this is probably one of the more bread and butter injections that we do fairly often. We use, generally use a larger amount of steroids, something on the order of 40 to 80 milligrams, depending on the specific indication. Uh, use a, we'll use a spinal needle, generally uh, we use 22 gauge for the majority of the injections that we do in a long axis approach as I mentioned earlier. And, the patient, and depending on patient body habitus, uh, we will use either a curved linear or sometimes we, we need to use a sector transducer in order to see deeply enough. So this is what would this, this would typically look like if we were doing a hip injection. You basically want to direct your needle to the femoral head neck junction right over here. Uh, since the capsule becomes a little more redundant distally, so this is sort of the sweet spot, if you will, and it's a fairly broad target to, uh, to aim for. Uh, once we place our needle in, you're going to go in obliquely. You can see the needle relatively well as a specular reflector. Uh, you'll feel when you hit the cortex of the bone, you can do a little test injection, make sure you get a few little micro bubbles, a little fluid there with uh, some anesthetic, and then you know you're interarticular, then you can do your injection and you're going to look for distension of the joint capsule. You may see if there are micro bubbles, they may go to the non-dependent surface of the joint as we saw earlier in one of the video clips. And in this case, the micro bubbles are actually outlining this uh, anterior labrum. And sometimes that can actually give you a little bit of a contrast effect as well and actually even show some potential labral pathology. Glenohumeral joint injections we do with the patient decubitus. Uh, the patient is lying on their side, so the shoulder is up. Transducer is positioned posteriorly along the shoulder. The needle comes uh, sort of uh, deep to the transducer, deep to the infraspinatus tendon and joint capsule. This is what this would look like uh, if we, when we position the, the patient. Uh, 
And uh, so this is what this will look like on, on a real-time examination. Here's the infraspinatus muscle belly, a thin echogenic capsule, the hypocoic articular cartilage. I like to place my needle tangential deep to the capsule, and I find that to, to be the easiest type of way to do these injections. And then what we're going to see, as, as we had before, we're going to see the, as we're doing the injection, there'll be distension of the dorsal recess, and you may see low-level echoes flying away from the needle tip corresponding to the contrast effect due to the fact that it's a suspension that we're injecting. Now, bursa and tendon sheaths, those are the synovial line structures that we see throughout the musculoskeletal system. Uh, we can characterize them as either deep or superficial. Uh, the typical uh, deep bursa that we're asked to inject or aspirate or baker cysts or iliopsoas bursa. Generally, we'll use a spinal needle. The approach may be a little bit more variable depending on wh which way we optimally see the, si the cyst, although short axis is probably the one I tend to use more often. Again, the transducer will vary depending on patient body habitus and, and as, as will the, uh, the amount of steroids. The superficial bursa, the typical example of that we saw before is a retrocalcaneal bursa or mo most tendon cheese. We can do these largely with a 25 gauge needle and a short axis approach using a high frequency linear transducer and generally a small amount of steroids similar to what we would use in a small joint. So this is a typical Baker cyst. Uh, this is seen in short axis. The medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle is over here. Semimembranosis is over here. This is the cyst uh, that we see usually nicely distended this way. Uh, here's my needle situated within the cyst and then what we're gonna do is aspirate the cyst and so here's the collapse cyst that we would, would see collapse during real time uh, when we're observing in real time. And I usually like to leave a little bit of fluid in there so I can see the needle tip still. And then what I'll generally do is I'll put a small amount of steroid and, and anesthetic in there. Iliosoas bursa, oftentimes uh, we're, more in a we're in a position to inject these rather than aspirate them uh, because uh, patients may have chronic uh, groin pain due to stretching the, the tendon if they've had previous arthroscopic surgery or if they have an indwelling prosthesis. So I would say probably greater than 90% of the time we're actually looking to find the bursa rather than to aspirate it. Uh, just to get you familiar with the anatomy, uh, we generally look for the tendon at the level of the iliopectineal eminence of the hip. You see the femoral head. You see it as, a, a, if you're looking at an MR, it'll be sort of an elliptical low signal intensity structure right by the femoral head, neck, uh, head junction with the acetabulum. On ultrasound, what we see is the echogenic reflector corresponding to that iliopectineal eminence. The femoral head is over here. This is the capsule, and you see this elliptical echogenic area corresponding to the iliopsoas tendon overlying iliopsoas muscle we see overlying that and the pectineus muscles uh, is somewhat more medial. So let's see what this injection will look like. We come with a short axis approach. I use a 22 gauge spinal needle and what I'm going to do is come in laterally. The, the uh, nerve vascular structures are situated medially so this way we avoid those structures. So here's my needle coming in laterally. Go, I tend to go just deep to the uh, tendon. I aim for the iliopectineal eminence, and what you're going to do is you're going to do a test injection with some anesthetic. And what I find helpful is that once you hit bone, you may want to pull the needle back a little bit, feel, look to feel that release. And when you feel the release, you'll, no, you'll notice in real time you're going to start descending the bursa. And once you start descending the bursa in your right location, you can switch in and start putting your cortisone as I've done over here, and, and this is that contrast effect that we see actually is a swirling phenomenon as we're doing the therapeutic injection itself. The other scenario, of course, is uh, aspirating the cyst, and we th I tend to see this more often in patients that have indwelling hardware. So here's an MR of a patient with an arthroplasty, the susceptibility artifact due to the metallic uh, hip replacement. You see this large collection that's complex over here. Uh, in this axial image uh, corresponding to a uh, large distended iliopsoas bursa. Here's a corresponding coronal image showing that bursa. And you can really see these are, can be quite complex on MR. Uh, what's good about ultrasound is that, uh, as I mentioned before, is the orthopedic hardware doesn't interfere with the ability to see the overlying soft tissues. So here's a sagittal image on MR. Of that area, you have all the susceptibility artifact. Uh, that's something that can somewhat obscure the bursa. Corresponding ultrasound, we have no difficulty. This, this is the metallic component with the reverberation artifact, but notice how nicely we see this overlying bursa, as well as noticing the degree of complexity. So sometimes we actually get a better sense of the complexity of these cysts on ultrasound than we can with MR because we can much more easily see the fluid components.
Now the important thing to recognize, particularly with a large ileosospersa, is that sometimes you have displacement of the femoral nerve, so it's important to remember what nerves look like. This is actually the femoral nerve, which is displaced by, by mass effect, so you want to make sure if you're coming in here to a short axis approach, you want to see that nerve so that you're not inadvertently sticking the nerve. In this case, we saw the nerve very well, so we placed our needle underneath it to get to the various cystic components of the, uh, of the bursa that we could subsequently aspirate and then inject with a therapeutic mixture. We spoke before about the superficial bursa, and a typical example of that is a deep retrohocanal bursa. So this is a short axis approach. Uh, this is the Achilles tendon seen in cross section. Here's the calcaneus. I'm going to advance my needle in short axis. So the way my transducer is positioned, it's going to, you're actually going to see the needle as a long axis structure going to whatever little bit of fluid you have. If you don't see fluid, uh, you're going to go right where the tendon inserts uh, on the calcaneus. You're going to do a test injection with lidocaine, and usually you can find the bursa, and once you find the bursa, you can put a little bit of lidocaine in there, give you a little bit of fluid standoff, and then you can put in your therapeutic mixture, and as you inject the therapeutic mixture, you're going to again see that contrast effect. So this is what this would look like in short axis if I was scanning along the long axis of the needle. If I turn my transducer uh, along the long axis of the tendon, we're going to see what we would expect to see in terms of the cross-section of the needle with that corresponding reverberation artifact situated within a distended retrocalcaneal bursa. We use the same principle for other, short, for other types of tendon sheath. This is a long head of biceps tendon sheath injection. And we find that for distended biceps tendon sheaths, uh, it's fairly simple just to scan over, immediately over the long uh, head of the biceps tendon sheath, scan anteriorly, come in from a lateral approach. And since we see the fluid fairly well, we can avoid the tendon, thereby avoiding doing an intratendinous injection, as, as I've indicated in this next image here. And we can aspirate whatever fluid we see and then do our therapeutic injection as we did here. And you see that contrast effect nicely distending uh, the, uh, the bicipital uh, tendon sheath. Now, what happens if the sheath is not, uh, is not well distended? Well, in those situations, uh, we tend to go or find it more convenient to go directly into the rotator interval. The rotator interval is actually surrounded by a pulley uh, corresponding due to the corcohumeral ligament going superiorly and the superior glenohumeral ligament uh, going inferiorly. And what I find uh, helpful to do is place the needle just between those structures adjacent to the tendon, do a test injection with lidocaine. If it's going in easily, you have enough back pressure from the injection that it'll fill both the bicipital tendon sheath as well as fill the rotator interval. This is what this approach would look like uh, with the patient recumbent and externally rotated. Now, this is um, on uh, an ultrasound. Basically, when you're going in the rotator interval, you want to find the tendon here, usually situated between two soft tissue structures, this uh, corcohumeral ligament above, superior glenohumeral ligament below. You're going to go right to the margin, do a test injection, make sure it's smooth, flowing smoothly and you're not getting intratendinous. And once you do that, you can do your injection. And uh, this is uh, this particular patient. We scanned over the bicepal tendon sheath after doing the injection. This is the bicep tendon here, and you see the contrast effect from the nicely distended bicipital tendon sheath. And in fact, you see echoes uh, also going into the rotator interval. And actually, it's very helpful to inject both these structures since both are implicated with, uh, patients in, in patients with bicipital tendinosis. The same principle applies to other uh, tendon sheath injections throughout the musculoskeletal system. This is a posterior tibial tendon sheath injection. We, I usually put the patient decubitus so that the medial side is up. And usually I go inframeliolar because oftentimes there's a small amount of fluid that you can go. And if you have fluid, that's always a helpful thing to target. If not, basically you're going to place your needle into the, where the expected uh, location of the tendon sheath is. And you're going to try to make a tendon sheath effusion initially with anesthetic. And then you're going to do your therapeutic mixture, inject your therapeutic mixture. So here's my needle coming in. There's actually a little bit of fluid distending the tendon sheath here. And after I do my, uh, do my injection, you're going to see the contrast effect as the, as the fluid is going in. And then once we're done, we're going to have nice uh, distension of the tendon sheath, both in short axis here, as well as we're seeing in the long axis here. And you can see the tendon margins very nicely. So you get sort of a little bit of a tenosinographic effect by virtue of doing the injection as well. Decrevain's uh, tendonitis is a uh, stenosing tendonitis that we see in the first dorsal compartment. The issue that we have here is we both have the tendonitis or tendinosis, and we have a thickened retinaculum. 
So what I find helpful to do is to use a short axis approach again. We tend to go distal to the retinaculum, oftentimes where there's a little bit of tendon sheath effusion. This is what this would look like uh, when we're setting the patient up. Again, we're going to go, it's going to be a short axis approach relative to the tendon location. And the structures you want to be able to see, and one of the advantages of ultrasound is you avoid the radial artery. Uh, there's a saphenous vein as well as recurrent uh, branch of the radial nerve, and those structures are all can be seen on real-time examination so that you can avoid them when you do these injections. And what I find particularly helpful is to go just distal to the, uh, the extensor retinaculum in the first dorsal compartment. Uh, and you can oftentimes see the radial artery as it courses into the snuff box, and then you can avoid it very easily and, and, and place your needle wherever there's a little bit of fluid or do a test injection as you need to to distend the tendon sheath. And once we've done that, and th these are these uh, two tendonotic tendons, uh, we have nice extension of the tendon sheath. The one caveat I would mention here is that occasionally you may have an intervening septum separating out these two structures. Usually it's not uh, difficult, uh, it's not difficult diagnostically to distinguish that there's a septum there. So you may have to do one injection and potentially advance your needle to get into the other tendon sheath uh, for, the, for the two tendons that occupy the first dorsal compartment. Now, another type of injection that we do fairly often in our practice uh, is uh, the flexor hallucis longus tendon sheath injection. Now, these, uh, you typically see these in patients who do a lot of plantar flexion, so uh, ballet dancers are one particular group that we see often in our practice, and uh, they tend to do hyper plantar flexion, and, and they're predisposed to get these posterior impingement syndromes. And they, get a, get, they can get a stenosing tenus endovitis similar to what we see in a de Crevain's patient. And basically, this is where we're going posterior to the uh, talus and calcaneus. Uh, there's this retinaculum. And uh, right in the sulcus over here is uh, where we often see uh, tendinosis because of this uh, constriction due to the retinaculum. And this is the approach we would take. Uh, now, because of the, the way the neurovascular bundle is situated, I'll usually scan medially and come in lateral to the Achilles tendon. So let's see what that looks like anatomically. So here's an MR which shows the uh, posterior sulcus of the talus and the flexor hallucis longus tendon. My transducer is situated along the medial aspect of the, uh, of the ankle. The Achilles tendon is situated over here. I can see the neurovascular bundle over here. And you can see the advantages of coming lateral to the Achilles tendon is that you can come in to the where the tendon is located. You can avoid the neurovascular structures. And you, see, see the, you still see the needle nicely as a specular reflector. So this is what the corresponding anatomy looks like in ultrasound. Here's the tendon, the neurovascular structures. Achilles tendon is situated around over here. And once we place our needle in laterally, we place it usually along the sulcus, deep to the tendon. We're going to again do a test injection with 1% lidocaine, and we're going to see distension of the tendon sheath. And that's what we're looking for uh, when we're doing these examinations. You also, uh, I can't help but stress the, the feeling uh, that, that, the, uh, that when you're doing the injection, it feels almost like injecting a joint. So it should go in fairly easily. Ganglion cysts uh, are those cysts that we see uh, oftentimes in the dorsal aspect of the wrist as well as the foot and ankle, although they can be anywhere in the musculoskeletal system. They're filled with this clear gelatinous material. They can be very hard to palpation on physical examination. Uh, so the needle and approach will vary depending on how the cyst is oriented and how thick the material is. Sometimes you need to go in with a fairly uh, large bore needle. Uh, but sometimes uh, you, I've actually treated these with as little as a 22 gauge needle. So it can be quite variable depending on uh, how tenacious the material is you're injecting. Uh, this was an example of a dorsal ganglion cyst of the tail and navicular joint in which we took a short axis approach. And here's our needle coming into the cyst. And then after, after we finish aspirating it, you see the, the cyst has collapsed. Now this is, uh, this is a fairly, uh, Simple situation where it actually probably could have been done clinically as opposed to under ultrasound guidance. The situation in which we really play a significant role is more the occult ganglion cyst, which is difficult to palpate, but these can be quite symptomatic. And these are often occur in the dorsal aspect of the wrist, of the dorsal scaphalunate ligament. This little cyst over here, for instance, was quite symptomatic for this patient and uh, was difficult to palpate. But here's my needle come in, actually using a long axis approach, in this case, into the center of the cyst. We lavage it, aspirate it, and, and, and uh, usually what I'll do is I'll fenestrate the cyst afterwards to break up the wall and, and leave a little bit of cortisone. And, and these patients all typically use celestone as opposed to something like triamcinolone or depamedrol.
parameniscal or paralabral cysts are cysts that we see typically situated around the knee, the shoulder, or the hip. Uh, in the shoulder in particular, they can be symptomatic because they can cause a compressive neuropathy of the suprascapular nerve. In the knee, they cause uh, pain more because of mechanical properties against uh, adjacent structures. Uh, we're almost invariably associated with a fibrocartilaginous tear, although they don't necessarily have to be. And the approach will be variable depending, again, how the cyst is oriented. So here's a, so this was a case of a parameniscal cyst that we have over here in a general meniscal tear. This is an extended field of view image showing that cyst. And then uh, the, and I'm limiting the cyst in short axis, and you can see my needle coming in over here. One of the things about these cysts is they can have a fair amount of echogenic debris within them, so you may not be able to aspirate them quick, uh, completely, but at least you have a better sense of what you can and can't do, which is, one of the, again, one of the features that's very helpful with ultrasound because I think you get a better sense of what the cyst contexts are really like. And this is after uh, injecting. This is the contrast effect of the appearance of microbubbles. This is an example of a suprascapular cyst, corresponding fluid-sensitive sequence on MR. This is a coronal uh, image showing this large suprascapular cyst. And a branch of the suprascapular nerve usually passes right in this area, and these patients can get, be quite symptomatic due to developing a compressive neuropathy. Here's my needle coming in using a long axis approach through the supraspinatus muscle belly to get into the cyst. And again, these are fairly easily approached on, under ultrasound guidance. This is another, uh, super this is another type of uh, uh, paralabral cyst. This is in the posterior aspect of the shoulder, the so-called spinal glenoid notch. Uh, on MR, we're looking posteriorly. So this is this notch that we see over here. This is the infraspinatus situated above it. Uh, on ultrasound, I'm going to look for this depression in the bone. The humeral head's over here. And uh, this is the cyst over here. And as indicated by the little asterisk. And uh, here's my needle tip that we place in the cyst. We come in through a, a sort of a, a long axis approach along the posterior aspect of the shoulder into the cyst. And then uh, uh, here's the contrast effect. So we know for sure that, we're, that our needle's situated within the cyst. And that contra so that contrast effect is very reassuring to know that we, in fact, are in the right location. We're going to do our aspiration and, in and injection. Now, there are a number, variety of other types of injections that we do. Uh, I've listed several here, neuromas, perineural, intratendinous, muscle injections, and so forth. Let's, let's briefly uh, speak about several of these. Neuromas are the so-called reactive pseudotumors that we have uh, in our feet. They form uh, in the interdigital, uh, about the interdigital nerves, most commonly between the second and, and the second and third web spaces. On ultrasound, they appear hypococcus over here. Uh, uh, we may see a thickened nerve going into them. They're fairly characteristic, relatively easy to diagnose under ultrasound. And uh, what I'll generally do is, uh, is place my needle. You can go through either a dorsal or a plantar approach into the uh, neuroma. Use a 25-gauge needle, uh, a, similar to, a similar amount of steroid as you would with a small joint injection. And what you typically see is uh, the needle placed here. And you get that sort of contrast effect that we spoke about earlier, where the, where the entire neuroma will brighten up as you, uh, as you do your injection. And you also frequently will fill an associated intermetatarsal bursa at the time of the injection, which is not a bad thing because it gives the steroid, keeps the steroid sort of in a contained space. Uh, and these patients do quite well. I would say about 80% of them actually get very good uh, therapeutic relief. This was a 19-year-old that had a neuroma of the superficial peroneal nerve uh, that were asked to uh, do a therapeutic injection on, see whether or not they would uh, respond to potential uh, nerve ablation. Uh, and you see it as a small hypocognodule. Uh, again, this is a, this, this case, this is a post-surgical neuroma. And our needle's coming down to where the neuroma is located. We're going to inject in and around it. And you can see all those surrounding steroids. So we basically go in, into it as well as doing a peri- uh, uh, neuromal in injection as well. Carpal tunnel syndrome, as, as in other peripheral nerve abnormalities, are uh, also areas that we're asked to look at. Um, I won't spend much time on it other than say that we see the median nerve very well in the superficial aspect of the carpal tunnel. There are various criteria out there for diagnosing abnormality of the nerve. We see it very well and can do this diagnosis fairly easily on ultrasound. Um, what I generally do is take a short axis approach in these patients, place my needle through the flexor carpi radialis. Below the uh, epinorium, which is the echogenic tissue surrounding the nerve, if, if you remember, and we're basically going to look to do hydrodissection of the nerve away from the flexor retinaculum as well as uh, adjacent uh, to the adjacent tendons. Uh, 
So here's uh, basically, here's uh, some of the perineural injected material after we've done our part of our hydro dissection, and we're gonna eventually put in our therapeutic mixture after we do that. Same principles can be applied to peripheral nerves anywhere, and this is actually one of the more common things we're asked to do in our practice, to do small peripheral nerve perineural injections. You're gonna find the nerve, you look for the characteristic hypocoque appearance with the surrounding epinorium, place your needle uh, adjacent to it. I oftentimes go both above and below it, and you're gonna really look to do hydrodissection. Uh, what I tend to use with these nerve blocks is, uh, is not only uh, celestone, uh, because you avoid the issues of depigmentation and atrophy, I uh, tend to use a stronger uh, anesthetic, something like 0.75% marking, because you get a more, pr a more significant nerve block. Uh, and when you do that hydrodissection, you generally will dissect fluid and, and actually will run a, a long, several centimeters along the nerve core. So it, you can find these, uh, this, these, uh, these nerve blocks actually work exceedingly well uh, using this approach. Few minutes, let's talk about, for a few minutes, let's talk about uh, intratendinous injections. Uh, so tendinosis that's refractory to standard conservative treatments uh, uh, such as cortisone injections and uh, physical therapy. Uh, one method that's been used advocated to treat these uh, patients are, are uh, uh, intratendinous fenestration and then, uh, or combining intratendinous fenestration with, uh, with uh, orthologous blood and platelet rich components. Now, it was described initially in the literature um, uh, by colleagues of uh, mine in this organization, such as Dr. Nazarian, is, is doing fenestration where you simply place a needle into the tendon. And this is a patient with a lateral epicondylosis. Uh, and what you're doing is you're placing your needle and you're basically fenestrating. Uh, causing bleeding response. You place your needle all the way up to the bone, try to irritate the periosteum, and that, and those, uh, and that procedure helps uh, produce bleeding and, uh, and results in release of local growth factors that promote healing response. Well, the next iteration of this, as you might guess, would be to try to put these growth factors in, in higher concentrations. And we can do that either by directly injecting blood or even going one step further by taking the blood and spinning it down to remove the platelet-rich component. Uh, in which case we're do placing in high concentrations of uh, growth factors. So here's a patient with uh, lateral epicondylosis and in which we're gonna do a PRP injection. And here's my needle again. We're gonna be fenestrating because that works uh, well. And then we're, we're gonna be doing our injection. And what you'll notice is when we're doing the injection, you have all these little micro bubbles due to the uh, little bit of gas that's probably within the injected material. So this is a 61-year-old 61 female runner with buttock pain who had a large tear in her hamstring tendon origin that we were asked to do a uh, PRP in. So here's my needle uh, in the uh, tendon as I'm doing fenestration, and we're going to do our PR, PRP injection. And this is her three months follow-up. You can see that the tear is significantly smaller, and she was feeling significantly better. Uh, this is actually a professional ballet dancer uh, who had acute onset of pain during rehearsal. And uh, this, this coronal image, uh, this is a proton density imaging. Uh, this is her peroneus brevis or peroneus longus below. And you can see there's some pathologic signal intensity within the peroneus brevis tendon. If we look at the corresponding ultrasound, this is uh, scanning, uh, again, similar to the coronal plane. This is all the peroneus uh, brevis tendon, which is markedly enlarged with a longitudinal split tear. Peroneus uh, longus is situated below, so it's significantly smaller. Uh, and uh, so what we were asked to do is to do a PRP injection in this patient. So this is in long axis, so with my needle situated within the tendon as we're doing fenestration and injection. And this is a short axis, this is the reverberation artifact from the needle as it's passing into the tendon. And you can see the appearance of these little micro bubbles uh, as, we're placed, as we're injecting the tendon. And often these tendons with the uh, surrounding tendon sheaths, uh, the, the injector takes the path of least resistance, so it may actually distend the tendon sheath, which means it coats the entire length of the tendon, which is actually a good thing. This is her at baseline. This is an extended field of view image just to show you her response. Uh, this is her at four months later, where the tendon looks still a bit abnormal, but has much more normal morphology uh, relative to uh, what it looked like before. She's clinically much better, and she was able to begin dancing again at, at a high level, and she was uh, one of the principal dancers of this company, so uh, uh, that was quite significant in her case. <laughs> 
Calcific tendonitis or tendinosis is, a, is an area where we have hydroxy, calcium hydroxy appetite uh, depositing within the tendon. These can be quite painful lesions. They almost appear as sort of pasty material. We see them most often in the rotator cuff, but they can occur anywhere in the musculoskeletal system. And uh, so generally, uh, we're asked to treat these quite often because ultrasound has been shown to be an excellent way to do this. Uh, in our practice, we use a single needle technique where we, what we want to do is place the needle centrally within the calcification, do a series of lavage, uh, a sort of lavage technique, then eventually fenestrate it and do a therapeutic injection into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So this is my needle placed within the calcification. This is while I'm doing uh, lavage and aspiration, and you can see this becomes uh, progressively filled with uh, fluid. So this is what this would look like in real time. My needle's placed in a calcification here, and you have this sort of fish mouth appearance as we're lavaging it. And we usually go through several syringes, but initially we start out with 1% lidocaine, and then eventually we move on to sterile saline. And I've actually had as many as 10 to 15 syringes of calcium, but these patients feel immensely better when you, once you've done the procedure on them. The kind of material you get out is indicated over here. This is a radiograph of uh, some of this uh, f uh, material and it's calcium hydroxyapatite, so as you would expect, it's radio opaque uh, uh, with an X-ray. Now, muscle aspirations are again the is another area that we're asked to uh, aspirate uh, and not infrequently. Uh, these are patients, uh, oftentimes high-level athletes that have had uh, muscle uh, strain injuries. Uh, there's no real definitive data out there to show benefit, although uh, at least in our experience, and I think among many clinicians, it's believed to be beneficial in assisting their recovery. Uh, but what I would say is that it's, hel it's helpful to do it earlier rather than later, because once these, uh, these hematomas begin to organize, they can be fairly difficult. So this was a 30-year-old professional baseball player, had a quadriceps tendon grade two strain. You could actually see this high signal intensity here within the rectus femoris corresponding to a small seroma. Corresponding ultrasound image over here, we see the, the, my needle placed into the seroma. We're gonna aspirate it, and here's the after aspirating the seroma. And this actually, this patient who was not rehabbing well, uh, return, was able to return to practice within 24 hours following the aspiration. So in his case, it actually made a significant uh, result, had a significant result. Cortisone injections, uh, there are several case series out there that suggest a potential benefit. It's somewhat controversial. Uh, the longest series was actually in uh, NFL players. Um, uh, this uh, was reported in 13 years of experience uh, uh, injecting these patients with hamstring quadriceps tendon injuries or muscle injuries. And uh, in their experience, uh, these patients actually did quite well. Uh, some authors suggest there can be negative effects uh, due to the uh, either uh, diminished tensile strength from uh, or weakening of the muscle from the uh, um, steroid injected in the muscle as well as uh, promoting muscle atrophy. So generally speaking, there's no uh, consensus out there in the literature, although I would say that at least in my own experience, uh, these patients do fairly well. So here's uh, one such patient that had a hamstring injury that we're asked to inject under uh, ultrasound guidance with steroid and, and actually he returned to practice fairly uh, rapidly. So generally speaking, uh, well, we, we will just reserve these for grade one to two uh, strains. Uh, if there's a well-encapsulated seroma, we'll uh, look to aspirate that first before we do the cortisone injection. Uh, and what I tend to do is, to, is confine myself to a rapidly uh, absorbed steroid, something like celestone or dexamethasone, both of which are usually re resorbed extremely rapidly, so you don't have the uh, long-term uh, deposition of steroid in there, which I think is what may promote the... Uh, the uh, muscle atrophy. And so this is what lo this would look like in this another patient over here. He has a small seroma, and we're gonna aspirate it, and then we did our therapeutic injection. Platelet-rich plasma injections are again are somewhat controversial in uh, in the muscle in muscle injuries. Uh, there is strong supporting evidence to suggest that it works in vitro and in animal experiments. There are some limited cl clinical results out there that shows the beneficial effects of it. Although uh, there's one of the f uh, there are some issues that need to be resolved. There's, uh, as in addition to limited literature, uh, no there's no optimal method or frequency of doing these injections that has been uh, purported in the literature. Uh, what system it to use optimally is not exactly clear what the ideal post-injection therapy should be. Uh, and also one of the growth factors that is something called TGF-beta, uh, which actually promotes uh, local fibrosis uh, and actually predisposes this for scar uh, formation. And one of the problems with scar remodeling within muscle, it actually produces a nidus for the muscle to re-tear. So that's uh, one of the clinical concerns.
in, uh, in using uh, platelet-rich plasma in these patients. So finally, let's talk about implant complications. There's a variety of complications where ultrasound can be very helpful. And as I said before, the fact that there's indwelling hardware doesn't impede our ability to uh, assess the overlying soft tissues. So here's a 49-year-old female with groin pain and uh, suspected ileocellus tendinosis. So we're asked to do an ileocellus bursa injection on her. Here's my needle coming in short axis. There's a metallic component over here, which obviously does not impede our ability to see the tendon. So I place my needle down to the aeopectineal eminence below the tendon. I'm going to do my, my test injection. I'm beginning to distend the bursa over here. You get a sense of how inhomogeneous this tendon is because they have a little bit, it's getting through a little bit of a fluid standoff, so it's a little more conspicuous now. And uh, then after I've done my injection, I'm looking in long axis, and you can see the, this very inhomogeneous tendon with fluid sort of dissecting along it due to a, with a successful injection. And she did very well as, re as a result of this. This uh, is a patient that were sent to us for joint injection. The patient, if you look at the radiograph, there's extensive osteolysis. The question is whether or not this was, uh, this was a septic or aseptic uh, osteolysis. Uh, and we usually will do a therapeutic injection in these a therapeutic aspiration in these patients. So here's a long axis view showing a very sort of thickened uh, uh, pseudocapsule and there's some complex fluid over here. The, the, this next uh, image, you can see this is then the capsule. This is my needle tip and the uh, anterior recess of the joint and we actually withdrew 40 cc's of purulent material from the joint. So in summary, we've seen a lot of examples where musculoskeletal ultrasound can be very helpful for performing guided injections. The important things I wanna stress again is know the basic scan techniques. Know the sonographic anatomy. It's very important to know your equipment, how to optimize your images, as well as optimally choose your transducer uh, for the approach you're gonna take, and then plan your approach to ensure optimal needle visualization. And I think if you do that, you'll, you'll find it to be very beneficial in your practice. Thank you very much.